All right, this morning, um, Joshua chapter 3. Um, the title of the message this morning is Crossing Your Personal Jordan River. Crossing Your Personal Jordan River. We're going to talk about, in the book of Joshua in the Old Testament, on how it literally happened in biblical history with the Israelites and Joshua as the leader. But we're also going to relate it to us on how sometimes we have to be able to trust God to take us and cross over the Jordan River, especially with the many obstacles uh, in our lives. Uh, this morning is about uh, believing God for the impossible. This morning is about taking a risk and stepping out in faith. This morning is about knowing that God is right in the middle of your Jordan River uh, before he takes you across to pass through it. Um, I was doing some research on Winston Churchill recently, and we know who Winston Churchill is, and for those of you who had, and he was really an appointed time, possibly directly by God himself, by putting in history during World War II as he served England as a leader during the time of um, the Nazis and the, and, and the Germans, or the Germans and the Japanese. Um, so Hitler says this, and again, talking about obstacles that we face, or Jordan River that we face, and he is quoted by saying this, success is not final, failure is not final, it is the courage to continue that counts. And so we know there are numerous uh, biblical characters and other people in history whose struggles really are a proof of extraordinary courage they possess, even when every circumstance was screaming at them to quit. And so when circumstances are screaming at you to quit, we see people in all of history, according to biblical history, where they did not quit, that they trusted God to get them through. Many people prevailed with faith and turned their days of adversity into a lifetime of success. One Christian came to me recently and said, and asked this, or actually uh, made a statement to me and said, Pastor, I feel so overwhelmed right now in my life. What should I do? I feel like there's just too many obstacles. My response was, you and God take one at a time. Because a lot of times if we look at the big, big picture all the times, we're going to stay overwhelmed. It's never, nothing's ever going to happen. We're just going to be overwhelmed all the time if we keep looking at the big picture. And a lot of times God doesn't reveal to us the big picture because it's too much for us. And so we say, you know, God, what am I supposed to do now? Or what am I supposed to do next? We want God to lay everything out in front of us. And he doesn't do that. He takes us because he wants us to walk by faith. So every step he has us take, he reveals something. The next step he reveals something. The next step he reveals something. And so with the obstacles, um, we just have to make sure that we just, with God, just go ahead and attack one at a time. And then your mountain won't seem like a mountain that's unpassable. It will seem like something that you can really accomplish to go through. Another person that really was um, facing a lot of adversity, and this is historic as well, um, and I love a lot of history, but Frederick Douglass was an African-American gentleman who was born into slavery. He was separated from his mother at a young age, um, but he taught himself to read. And when he taught himself to read, he did it in secret because um, when there was times he was caught that he was teaching himself to read, he was beaten severely when they found out about it. Uh, he rebelled and finally escaped after numerous attempts. He became the leader of the abolitionist movement, gained a notoriety for his amazing oratory and incisive anti-slavery writing. So not only was he a talented writer, but when we speak of the orator, it's just like someone who would teach or preach, someone who would communicate um, just as we're doing this as I'm doing this morning. He was known uh, really for that. He traveled to Ireland and to Great Britain and gave excellent speeches in churches. He also started a very influential newspaper, which I didn't know about, called the North Star in 1847. His writings spoke with facts about anti-slavery. He also helped with the Underground uh, Railroad that helped many African-American slaves uh, escape up to the north. So we have an example of Winston Her Churchill and what he was able to go through with his adversity or crossing his personal Jordan on behalf of his country during World War II, Frederick slavery during the time, um, or Frederick Douglass, excuse me, during the time of slavery, and what he was able to go through. And now let's jump right into the scriptures, learn about Joshua and the Israelites in Joshua chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. 
Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shedem and went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. Now, Shedem is very important, and some of you might realize this, but Shedem was the very place it was called where Israel was on the banks of the Jordan River. So if the Jordan River is this red carpet in front of me, Israel was encamped on the banks, and it was called Shedem. And from Shedem, directly across from Shedem was Jericho. We knew eventually, as time went forward, this was going to be their next challenge, was to go to Jericho. But they were encamped right there, and that's where they were encamped in Shedem. And this happened to be the headquarters for Joshua at that time as they were getting attempting to go into the promised land. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priests, who are Levites, carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before, but keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the Ark. Do not go near it. Um, a football field is how long? Practically 100 yards. So think about a hundred, or think about ten football fields. So ten football fields in length is what they were instructed by God to stay away from the Ark of the Covenant. Joshua told the people, "Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. Lord will do amazing things among you." Joshua said to the priests, "Take up the Ark of the Covenant, pass ahead of the people." So they took it up and went ahead of them. Verse seven. And the Lord said to Joshua, "Today I will begin to exalt you in the eyes of all of Israel, so that you may know that I am with you as I was with Moses." This was super important because now Joshua was the new guy, and Joshua was elevated to be the new guy because Moses was gone. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you reach the edge of the Jordan's River, go and stand in the river. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Persites, Gigersites, Amorites, and Jebusites, and some people say mosquito bites. <laughs> See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. They'll then choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. As soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all earth, set foot in the Jordan, the waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. And finally, verse 14. So when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Now, the two spies we know in the story uh, were returned, had returned back from Jericho because they were sent out to go look and see what Jericho is all about because they followed Joshua's orders to check out the land, to check out the city. They had escaped, and as they escaped from their enemies, Rahab the harlot, we know the story about her, how she helped them, and since she helped them, God preserved her life um, as well when they came back in to conquer. But they came back to give the report to General Joshua and their hearts were bursting with joy as they said these words in Joshua 2:24. They said to Joshua, The Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of this. So this was the exact news that Joshua was waiting for. He wanted this report to come back. So he immediately dispatched runners throughout the whole camp of Israel so they can communicate. And that's how they communicate in the camp. It was just too many people. And so he had to send out runners to communicate to all the people announcing that the very first thing the next morning, this is what we're going to do. They would break camp. They would pitch their tents on the banks of the Jordan River. They would finally come to the entry point of the Promised Land. So they're right there on the banks of the Jordan River. The only thing stopping them to go into the Promised Land was the Jordan River. In Joshua 3, 1, early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from them, Shedem, and went to Jordan, where they camped before the crossing over. So the journey from the Acacia Grove to the river's edge was an easy one, just a few miles over smooth ground. So we can assume that the Israelites were properly finished relocating before the sun had risen up in the high sky. I'm sure the talk in all the tribes was pretty much the same. This is the day, guys. This is what we've been waiting for. There was a whole generation that died before us. Now we're this new generation. Now we have this new opportunity to go into the promised land that God promised to us. This is the day. So they're all getting excited. There's a bunch of uh, anticipation. They're on the brink of their dreams coming true. And so they're finally going to go into the place that was promised to them uh, from God and their forefathers. And their forefathers really blew it. Um, they were disobedient. They weren't able to go and they died out. They weren't able to go into the promised land because they were disobedient. 
But as they approached this famous river that formed a barrier between them and their longed after real estate, which they saw by the light of the day was both confusing and disappointing because before them was the Jordan River. Normally the Jordan River was not very wide, maybe 100 feet wide, maybe about two to six feet deep normally. But during harvest season, the Jordan River was known to go to a flood stage. And the flood stage is any time at all that you know anything about a flood stage with, a, with any kind of river. And what happens is it goes over the banks, it starts to expand, it becomes much wider, more dangerous, and much deeper. So now this is what they are facing. The Jordan River, in my opinion, I would say was in defiance. It was in defiance for anyone to able to humanly cross it. It was impossible to humanly cross it. Maybe some of the soldiers that were armed soldiers who fought with Israel were very successful in all the wars. Maybe they had the willpower and the strength and the know-how to cross the Jordan River on their own, but they couldn't do it because if they did, who were they going to be leaving behind? They were going to be leaving behind family. They're going to be leaving behind aged people, people up in age. They were going to be leaving behind the sick. They're going to be leaving behind little children. And what about all their possessions that maybe would go on some kind of wagons? Could they attach their wagons with all their or possessions to their wagons well enough that would stay with their wagons? Because the Jordan's River's current was extremely dangerous. And if you weren't, a good, even if you were a good swimmer. You might not even make it because at flood stage, this is a very dangerous river, and it happened to be the exact time that Israel was there. Jeremiah, in chapter 12, verse 5, I like how it says in the New Living Translation, if racing against mere men makes you tired, how will you race against horses? If you stumble and fall on open ground, what will you do in the thickets near the Jordan? And this was also something that was going on there as they were on the brink of the river noticing the current so strong, the river is deep because of flood stage, and they're noticing other things that around the banks around them, there was thickets of bushes and shrubs and just impassable things. Again, maybe a soldier can get through those things and was able to physically do that, but for the rest of Israel, most of them will be unable to do that. So at this time, the river was impassable. It was at flood stage. There was so much growth of things on both sides of the river it makes it impossible. So here's the scene. The Jordan is swelled at its banks, spreading about one mile across, ranging in depth from 3 to 12 feet in, in depth of the, the river, Covering thick undergrowth can easily trip someone up and cast them into an overwhelming current, and we know they would drown. But this was a site that greeted multiple, multiple thousands upon thousands of Israelite people who had their tents pitched at the side of the Jordan River, were excited to finally get into the promised land, never thought at all that the Jordan River is going to be a problem because back in our history, they're thinking back in our history, it was with Moses. And didn't God successfully part the Red Sea for his people to go across on dry ground? What is our God going to do now? God has to do something. And think about it in your life. You know what? God, I, I need you to show up. I need you to do something in my life. I am on the brinks of the Jordan River. The current is strong. It's too deep. I cannot humanly pass it on my own. God, you need to show up and do the miraculous. And our God is in the job of doing the miraculous for his people. So the Bible tells us that Israel spent three days and three nights there. And three days and three nights are popular in our Bibles. For an example, Matthew 12, verse 40, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Could you imagine the talk? Now, this is just imagination on our part. Could you imagine the talk in Israel's camp when they approached the Jordan River and witnessed the surrounding bushes and witnessed the current going by. And can you imagine the talk amongst them? The words probably appeared in their thoughts, hearts, and in their spirits. And they probably still had some words of unbelief. 
No way. There is no way we're going to be able to cross the river. As they listen to the roar of the water and watch the current stop with no break. And a lot of times God shows me, sometimes in the Christian church, we may have a loss of memory. Because we're facing something presently that's impassable for us, impossible for us, and we have a lack of memory. And God says, you know what? Don't have a lack of memory. Look over your shoulder and remember what I did for you yesterday? Since I was faithful to you yesterday, I can be faithful to you today and tomorrow. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But a lot of times we forget what God did for us. And when we forget what God did for us, our faith will be weak in the present. Does that make sense? So God doesn't want us to forget about what he's done in the past because what he did in the past, he's going to do the same thing for you today and even more for you the following day. So a lot of times if we are in an unbelief state or in a doubting state or we're kind of in a pouting state in our lives, we can relate a lot of times to the emotions and the unbelief that Israel was possibly facing. Our circumstances, our crisis can make us feel so permanent, make us feel there's so much against us, there's no way God's going to help us or able to help us to get through our own personal Jordan River. And when we feel that way, we feel our lives can be stalled. We feel that we can be unsettled. We feel that we can be stuck. And we can feel that maybe we're on the wrong side of God's promises instead of the abundant life he wants to give us so help us to get through to the Jordan River. God can turn a no way into a major highway. God can turn a no way situation into a major highway. He can hold back the current in our lives so we can walk through with him on dry ground into the promised land. Why? Is because we do not walk by sight, we walk by faith. So if we really believe that we serve the God of impossible, then it should not be impossible for God. Did Israel believe that God can get him to the promised land? Do you believe that God can help you cross over in your impossible circumstance or your impossible relationship? Do we really believe God is an obstacle remover? Now think about this next statement. Do we really believe that God is an obstacle remover in our lives? If so, we should believe that God can be an obstacle placer. Because our prayer is always, God, remove something. But when there's something there and God doesn't remove it, then the first third person we give credit to is the devil. Because it might be we perceive it as being something negative. But think about this. Yes, God can remove the obstacle that you're facing in your life, and we praise him for it. But what if it was God... Who put the obstacle there? And if he does put the obstacle there, it's because it's for our own benefit and for our own good and make people for uh, our own protection, but also it may delay us to trust in him enough because of his timing hasn't come to fruition yet. So we need to believe an obstacle always doesn't mean no, but it could mean wait. And we don't like to wait too much. Luke chapter 18, verse 27, Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So God will give his church, God will specifically give his Christians revelation knowledge and wisdom if we ask. God usually gives us the next step when he's ready for us to take the next step. He never reveals the whole blueprint or gives us that flashing billboard that we all would like to see as we're going down the road. Please don't look at all those billboards as you're traveling on Interstate 4 because you'll be in part of another accident. Interstate 4 is crazy. So God is ready for us to step aside and get out of his way. Let God move. God is waiting for his church to get extremely grounded in gratefulness. God is waiting for his church to go deeper in him. But Israel was camped on the banks of the Jordan River as a new generation getting ready to go in, but they were going to learn a huge lesson before they got into the promised land. And the lesson was this. You want the victory that you're asking me for? 
then you have to be completely dependent on me. You want victory in your life? Be completely dependent on God. A lot of times we want to give God recommendations. We want to give him suggestions. We want to give him options. You know, we're trying to help God. And think about it. It's really ridiculous, isn't it? We're really trying to help God. But why do we do that? We think he, we think he needs a helping hand for some reason. Can I assist you, Lord? You know, do you need something? And so Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 is a very popular two verses a lot of people love. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In your Bibles, if you do mark in your Bibles, underline lean not. Because that's a reminder of saying, you know what, I'm hands off. God's going to do it. I'm hands off. God doesn't need my assistance. God's going to do it. In all your ways, submit to him and you'll make your paths straight. So as they're standing on the brink of a God-sized, their future and all the obstacles are there, they're waiting for God to do something. Now, how does he do it? Think about this. In Joshua chapter 3, verses 2 through 4, if you look at those verses for a moment, I want you to think about this. How does he do it? How does he do it in our lives today? We know what he did back then. We read about it. We read about the history. We learn about history. History sometimes repeats itself. But here's how we do it. We follow the movements of God. We follow his movements. We don't, like, come up with this genius plan about what we're going to do for God, and then we say, oh, by the way, God, do you want to join me? Do you want to get on board with me? Do you want to help me fulfill my agenda? No, it's the other way around. We see what God is already doing, and since we're following his movements and his presence and his power, then we join him. It's not the other way around. So what did this command mean to Israel? Why would God care so much about a piece of furniture that he would require to go first? So when his piece of furniture he's talking about is the Ark of the Covenant, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is if you really knew what was inside of it, you would know why it's such a big deal. The stone tablets God gave Moses, written by the finger of God, as we know as the Ten Commandments, was a sign that God says, Israel, I want a relationship with you. That's important. There was a pot of manna in there in the Ark of the Covenant. It was a reminder of God's graciousness provision during the previous 40 years. Exodus 16 tells us, So Moses said to Aaron, Take a jar and put an omer of manna in it, the place before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron put the manna with the tablets on the covenant law so they may be preserved. And now don't forget this was also inside of the Ark. Please don't forget this. Uh, Aaron's rod, it was, it was originally a dead stick that miraculously grew leaves and almonds to validate the power of God to, that he can use anything at all. He can use a dead stick to, uh, if he needed to. I mean, he spoke through a donkey. I mean, come on. If he spoke through a donkey, used a dead stick, he's going to use somebody uh, as simple-minded as I am to be able to accomplish his will. Now, on the top of the ark, it's interesting because it has a gold plate. And on top of the gold plate, we know it's called the mercy seat. And on top of the mercy seat, and it's hard for me to do this with the microphone this way, but there's two cherubims with their angels, and they're kind of facing each other like this. And right below them is the mercy seat. Exodus 25, it says, And make two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. Make one cherub on one end and a second cherub on the other. Make the cherubim of one piece with the cover and at two ends. Psalm 80, verse 1. Hear us, shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, who will sit enthroned between the two cherubim, shine forth. Psalm 91, 99, 1. The Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the two cherubims, let the earth shake. So what did God do? God showed up right on top of that mercy seat. And so the ark is an Old Testament e equivalence to Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means what? God is with us. And so when the chest or the ark led the way, it meant that God was the one who would go out front. So when you pray and you need God to help you through your personal impassable Jordan River, allow the Lord to go before you. And a lot of times we're just kind of like, we want God to tag along with us. Come on, Lord, come on. 
Come with me. Come with me. This is where we're going. This is what we're going to do. And if you want to hang out with me or you want to tag along with me, come along. It's totally wrong because we have the example here, what God told his priests to do. I want you to pick up the Ark of the Covenant with the poles, put them on your shoulders, and I want you to take the Ark of the Covenant, and you guys go first. Which means the priests who are leaders, which means leaders to me, must go even deeper with their faith and deeper in the relationship with the Lord. Not that they're better than anyone else, but leaders really need to lead the way. So now they pick it up in the Ark of the Covenant. They're ready to go in. But Israel's job, our job, our responsibility is this. Our job is to follow God, number one. Number two is to pursue his presence. And number three is to go after him. Our job, our responsibility is to follow God, number one. Number two is pursue his presence. And three, to go after him. Look at Joshua chapter three, verse four. Then you'll know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about a thousand yards between you and the ark and do not go near it. You know what? It says here, since you've never been this way before. How many times have you said to somebody or said to yourself when you're facing something brand new, man, this is uncharted waters. This is something new for me. I never, I never experienced this before. Then God is saying, I got this. I already know what you're facing. I already know where it's going to go. But trust and follow me. Follow me. Pursue my presence and power and go after me. And God's got this. So God was very particular about the distance was kept from the ark, and the reasons are clear. He wanted all Israel to be able to see, possibly at the same time. He wanted all of Israel to see what he was going to do with the Jordan. Because if too many people got crowded together, and people just in the front row could only be the ones that were going to be able to see what was going on, that was not something what God wanted. He wanted them all to see. So imagine this. Israel's encamped on a sloping hill beside the Jordan River. The ark is a positioned 1,000 yards from then. Everyone in the nation would not be able to see it. The priests would bear the rods on their shoulders as they stride towards the water of the Jordan. God wanted the ark to go first with his priest right in the water. Now, if you fast forward this just for a moment, centuries later, the true ark of God would come among us, the living Emmanuel. The ark contained the Ten Commandments. Jesus fulfilled the law. Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The ark preserved the manna by which God fed them in the wilderness. And the parallel to that is that Jesus called himself the bread of life. The ark held a symbol of God's power to bring life out of death. Jesus was alive. He was dead. He then became alive as he rose again from the dead and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Hebrews 12 tells us, do this. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't fix your eyes on the news. Don't fix your eyes on what the world is going on in the world. Keep your eyes on the Lord and the scriptures because we know that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. So when you and I are facing an impossible Jordan River, do what Peter did when he walked on the water. He fixed his eyes on Jesus. But the minute that Peter took his eyes off of the Lord, what happened? He noticed his surroundings with the lightning and thunder and just like, wait a minute, people don't walk on water. This is humanly impossible. So what did he do? He took his eyes off of the Lord and put his eyes on himself. That's what we do. If we put our eyes on ourselves or we put our eyes on other people, then we're going to start to sink. If we keep our eyes on the Lord, we're going to be able to walk on the water. Now, here's the amazing parallel with this. Peter, the only disciple that had guts enough, enough courage, enough faith, he said, Lord, if that's you, bid me to walk out there. And Peter was the only one in the boat that did this. But Peter could not walk on the water until he did what? Peter had to take the first step on top of the waves. The Jordan River was not going to stop its flow and to dry up on dry ground until the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant, who were going first into the Jordan River, if the priests were unwilling to take the first step, the Jordan River wouldn't have dried up. Miles down the road in the river, 
God set up a heap. It was almost like a dam. But the water went up in a heap. And it stopped flowing where Israel must, were needed to cross to go into the Jordan River. And then God miraculously dried it up. Just like he did at the Red Sea. Guys, don't you remember? Let's remember what God did with Moses in the Red Sea. Let's remember because of what he's going to do for us today. So the priests, like Peter, took the first step. You and I have to take the first step. Don't be afraid to take a risk. Don't be afraid to do something crazy for God. If you, when you read your Bible, come on, some of those things are crazy, what's going on inside this Bible. Don't you think? So don't think that things always have to be logical. Don't think that things always have to make sense to you. And don't think that God ever needs your permission or my permission to do what he wants to do. Because some things just don't make sense. But God has a reason and purpose for it. And that's for him to receive glory and honor and praise. It's not for you and I to receive any credit for it. So as we come to an end, we see that the priests had to step out. But what's amazing to me in Joshua 3, 7 through 13, what was amazing to me when I learned something new here as I was studying this is that they did this. The priests were chosen. Remember, out of the 12 tribes of Israel, he says, just take one from each tribe. They put this rods of probably some kind of wood there that had holes that for the Ark of the Covenant, so they would be the ones to lift it up. They take their first step, and what's amazing to me is they did this. They took their first step, it started the process, and then they chose to do this. They stood still. Now, when this is going on, can you imagine the audience behind them? Thousands and thousands of Israelites waiting to go into the promised land that was promised to them through their forefathers, what God promised their forefathers through. There's such an anticipation. They're wondering what's going to happen next, what's going to happen next. And here goes the priests. They take their first step, and they didn't keep walking with the ark. God told them to take the first step. And when they take the first step, they did what they were supposed to do, nothing more, nothing less. And they stood still. Can we take the first step and stand still and watch our miraculous God move in our lives? Can we be willing to do that? Instead of thinking, well, maybe God wants me to take another step or another step. He didn't tell us to do that. God is very precise with his instructions. Look how precise he was to build the ark. For Noah. That was precise. The temple, what he wanted in it, how he had it built, precision, perfect. And a lot of times Israel got in trouble. We get in trouble when we do more than he's told us to do. Take the step, priest. And when they took the step, the water started to go away. And they stood still. And you can imagine the audience. Could you imagine the hush? The awe. How awesome is our God? They have front row seats. And with their front row seats, wait a minute. I think my great-grandfather told me what happened when Pharaoh and the Egyptians were pursuing our people? God just did the same thing again. We, we, can't, we can't cross. We have no ability to cross this flood stage river. Our God once again showed up. God doesn't just say to you individually, Hey, Reva, here's two miracles. That's all you get. Hey, Jack, here's three miracles. That's all you get. His unlimited resources are unbelievable. And they're watching this, and they're watching this, and they find out all the way, this is amazing, they find out from where they're standing in Shittim, it stops there 
but then it goes all the way down, miles away, to a town called Gilgal. It's documented. That's how far it went. Miles and miles and miles. And God stops the water and puts it up in this huge heap. It says to the water, since I created you, stop. When Jesus got out of the, when Jesus rose up and was sleeping in the boat, what did he do? He spoke to the nature he created and said, be still. And the Lord can say that to you in your lives. As there's turmoil, there's confusion, there's hurt, there's brokenness. He can rise up in the boat of your life and say, be still, storm. Be still. The last thing I want to share with you is this. Yes, God does everything, but God also uses you to participate. God chose to use the priests to carry the ark, and the ark, remember, is God, God's presence. God goes before. But God chose to use people to participate in his miracle. A lot of times the Lord can just go, boom, on his own, totally, 100%. He did it. Sometimes we don't even expect it, and he'll do it. But a lot of times he says, you know what? I choose to use you, Ken. I choose to use you, M. I choose to use you, Wally. I choose to use Anna. I choose to use you, Pastor Shannon. I choose to use you, Carrie. I choose to use you. You participate with me in the miracle. Don't come with your pockets empty with, with unbelief or filled with unbelief. Don't come with me that way. Don't bring unbelief my way. Bring your faith. When you bring your faith, you and I will be able to cross our personal Jordan River. Let's pray. With your heads bowed, um, you would say, hey, um, Pastor Terry, you know what? I am facing right now in my life what seems to be an impassable Jordan River. It's at flood stage, and there has been no signs of it changing. I know that God does things behind the scenes for us, the things that we don't see in the natural, but I still don't see anything. There's been really no change. I've been still dealing with the same old, same old. I've still been dealing with things, and I need to get to the other side. I need to be able to get into the promised land, and I need you to show up. I'm, I feel like in my life right now, the Jordan River at high stage with that current, that, you know, that can just be a boatload of financial difficulties. That can be a boatload of marriage relationships or any kind of relationships that are struggling. It can just be um, a ton of problems at work. Uh, it could be parenting issues, grandparents for their kids, grandparents or grandchildren. It could be whatever it is that you're facing. And you need the Lord to pile up that water in front of you and put it in a heap and you need for him to dry up the ground because you're not going to be able to go anywhere on wet ground you're going to get stuck so you feel like if I'm going to stuck in the middle of the river why do I even leave the why do I leave this, the shore why do I even leave the side of the river so God not only do I need you to put the water that's in front of me at flood stage up in a heap but I'd ask you, Lord, to please dry the ground. Dry the ground so that I can reach my hand out to you because I want to join you in what you're doing, Lord. Please forgive me if I've tried to run the show. Please forgive me if I've tried to offer suggestions to you. Please forgive me with my unbelief. I want to be able to offer my hand to you, Lord. The water is going away. The ground underneath the Jordan River is now becoming dry. But I still need to follow you, follow your movements, follow your presence, follow your power. I still need to go after you. And I need you to do this for us. I need you to do this for me. I've been hanging out in Shittim over here where I'm just on the brink of the of the river and I've just been camped out there a long time my, my tents have been up for a long time and I'm just waiting on you God I'm not, I'm not waiting impatiently 
I'm just waiting for you to move. I need you to show up big time in my life. Move that water. Dry the ground, please. Let me grab your hand, and let's walk together into the promised land. With your heads bowed and eyes closed just for a minute, how many would say, hey, Pastor Terry, I, I feel like I'm on the side of the Jordan River right now, and I'm facing what seems to be an impassable situation in my life. And, and, I, and I recognize that there's so much current and the water's deep and I, I can't swim across. If I try to do this on my own, I'm going to drown or I'm going to lose all my stuff. I choose to wait on you and let my God provide the miracle. How many raise your hand and say, Pastor, would you please pray with me? I'm standing on the side right now. I'm facing my Jordan River. How many raise your hands and say, I'm facing my Jordan River. Can I see your hands as you put them up? You're facing your Jordan River right now. Would everyone please stand with me? Now again, this is just an example. This is just an example. Okay? And in this example, it doesn't necessarily mean it's something very profound, but it's just an example. Because what's, what's really what we're asking the Lord to do is to meet us right at our Jordan River and to walk us through. But this is an example. So if I'm standing here with you, I'm standing here, and the Jordan River, as I look at it, and again, please, this is just a, an example. This red carpeting to me, as I'm looking at it right now, this is going to be my Jordan River. And I'm standing right here. This is as far as I can go. And I've been pitched out here with my tent for a long time. I've been praying. I've been believing God. I, you know, I need change. I need help. I can't do it. I, I don't have enough money to throw at this problem. I don't, there's not enough counseling I can, that, can, that I can do. There's not enough church stuff I can do. I just need my God to show up and do something miraculous. Because my goal is to be able to watch my God dry up this flood stage river. And I want to see my God dry it up. And I want to get to the promised land. And the promised land for me this morning, again, is just an example. The promised land is his altar. Is the promised land. But here's how we participate. We have to do this this morning. We step into the river, just like the priests. Because the Bible says the Christians are a royal priesthood, right? You're a priest. So we stepped into the river. Watch the waters go up into a heap. Far distance from you. God dries up the ground. So that you may continue to walk to your promised land. And here is where I believe... There's nothing magical about this, but here's where I believe the Lord's going to meet you and meet your need because you're following him. You're pursuing him as a person, as your God. And what comes with that, when we seek the Lord first, signs and wonders follows, but we seek him first. We don't seek signs and wonders. We seek Jesus and his power and presence is right here. And we know, we know, don't walk away thinking, well, isn't this power and presence right where I'm standing? Yes, yes, yes. But this is an example, just for an illustration. There's your Jordan where it starts. By faith, step into the river. He'll get rid of the water. He'll dry up the ground. Bring with you whatever you're facing and leave it here. Don't take it with you when you leave church. Don't take it with you. Leave it here. And when you walk and you stand, do this when you're here. Right, Pastor Shannon? Stand still and watch your God move. So if that's you, make your move now. Come to the Jordan. Step in it. Come to the promised land. Stand still. 
and give God praise.